been riddling the walls for the past one and a half years. Yeah, like, yeah. So, good evening and a warm welcome to one and all. My name is Shashwat DC, and on behalf of Azim Premji University, I heartily welcome you all to this another edition of Nature in Our City webinar series, which is part of our broader Seeking Sustainability initiative. You know, today happens to be a very special talk as we have completed a year with this series. We had launched this series last year in uh, March 2021 as we spoke about birds. Since then, we have spoken about uh, leopards, spiders, frogs, cockroaches, monkeys, and so on. And we hope in the months to come, we will get to talk about more of this fascinating flora and fauna that lives and thrives around us. You know, Coming to today's topic, I'm very thrilled to have Earthworm as our guest. We all have seen earthworms around us, wiggling and moving along. They have intrigued us and oftentimes also freaked us out. But we seem to know them, but we know so little about them also at the same time. You know, I remember uh, when I was uh, in my college days, we were dissecting, uh, you know, earthworms in our class to find what is inside them, but not to find how they impacted our lives. You know, during this course of, uh, you know, putting uh, this talk together, I even chanced upon, uh, you know, the, the kind of uh, importance that Charles Darwin, the father of modern biology, gave to the worms. He said, you know, they are, they are very much, he credited the worms who have played an enormous role in the human history itself. And, you know, by the way, his last book was on worms itself. Thus, while there are millions of worms, uh, these earthworms that live in our gardens, in our parks, in the agricultural fields, we seem to be blissfully and uh, oftentimes foolishly ignorant about them. Uh, now, to set that, uh, you know, wrong right, uh, we have a special guest with us who joins us from Chennai and is known as the Earthworm Man of India. Dr. Sultan Ismail, he's a soil scientist and presently member of the State Planning Commission of Government of Tamil Nadu. He has been an academician for decades and has given numerous talks and penned se several papers on the subject of soil conservation and yes, earthworms, including a recent book for children titled The Earthworm Book. Uh, thanks, Dr. Inspire. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Yes, sir. And, you know, talking to him, we have Vena Kapoor. She has an she has the Nature Classrooms project of the Nature Conservation Foundation. She has a master's in eco ecology from the University of Pondicherry and has done an MPhil in conservation le leadership from the University of Cambridge. And most importantly, she happens to be a lady who can tell you a million interesting things about creepy crawlies and spiders on a simple visit to the garden. Thank you so much, Vena, for you know agreeing to host this talk. Thank you for inviting me, Shashwat. And, uh, and professor, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, in fact, when uh, you are from uh, graduate from Pondicherry University, and I was born, and my schooling is from Pondicherry. Okay. <laughs> and yeah, now before I hand over the baton to you, just a small request to all our viewers uh, right now: we can, uh, you know, uh, type in your questions in the live chat box, and Vena will be, you know, taking them up and posing them to Dr. Ismail. And without further ado, sir, thank you so much again, and I look forward to this talk. Over to you, Vena. Thank you, Shashwat and uh, Professor Harmi for uh, inviting me to host this session today. It's uh, a great privilege to be here and to talk to uh, Professor Ismail. Um, and I just want to do a, have a, I'll just narrate a short story as, as to why I said immediately yes when they invited me to host this session. Um, I, uh, I met Professor Ismail about 25 years back. Uh, when I went, uh, when I was part of an organization called Center for Indian Health Systems, and we were organizing a workshop on organic farming methods, and one of the sessions there was on vermicomposting, and uh, so we went to the new college campus uh, where he was teaching, and it was my first experience of actually seeing what experiential learning was all about. He had these wonderful kind of contraptions of like huge crates and these old uh, bathtubs that he had put. Uh, in an area where he was kept for display and where he would showcase the roles of earthworm at every level. And it was fascinating to see how he took us through that journey, showed us earthworms, made us feel them, made us smell the soil. And I was just 
completely uh, blown away by how important an experiential learning experience is. Uh, you know, from that experience, and I took that on uh, in the work that I'm currently doing. So it's wonderful to meet you again, sir, after so many years. And I look Thank forward you. to this conversation. Uh, so Thank Professor Ismail will give us a short presentation for about 20 minutes, where he'll regale us with stories about earthworms and their importance. And then I'll then we'll have a short conversation, and then we'll open it up for questions. Yeah, over to you, sir. Yeah. Oh, where is it? Hi. Good evening, everybody. Earthworms. Beautiful organisms, and thanks to Shaswat and uh, Vena for uh, interacting with me. And let's have all the questions, whatever possible, about earthworms. I just want to tell that soil your hands today if you really want to have a sustainable future. And we always try to look at the sky, you know, every time to see the birds. We are not concerned about the organisms work beneath the soil. A few questions to you: Why it is important to know about earthworms? Keep it in mind. What can we do to have earthworms in terms of engagement with farmers, agriculture, universities, schools, households, communities, as a vocation, as uh, anything in the way? And what are some of the key steps to make this happen? With this in mind, I strongly believe that soil health is ecosystem health, and that is human health. And earthworm is an indicator of sustainability. See, basically, when I'm unwell, I go to a doctor, the doctor feels the pulse. If my pulse is normal, I am normal. If there's some problem with my pulse, then definitely I have some problem, right? In the same way, earthworm is the pulse of the soil. When I dig the soil and a native earthworm comes from inside and says, hi, that means that soil is healthy. It's as simple as that. You may say, sir, is earthworm alone doing the job? No. Supposing I ask you, you know, like, uh, what did you have for breakfast? You may say that I had an itli, I had a dosa, or I had a chapati, or I had a puri. But we forget to tell that I had chutney, or sambar, or dal, or anything with it, right? So what is the major component? Like, aaj kya khaya? Aaj humne chawal liya. Chawal ke saath humne kya liya? So all these components which go along with it, we usually ignore because the major component is rice or roti or whatever it is in the same way. If I find an earthworm in the soil, I presume that all other microarthropods, microorganisms, all are living over there as a healthy community. And the leader comes to say, hello. With this basic knowledge on earthworms, whenever you happen to have a soil, the best thing you can do is take a jar, put the soil, add water, shake it very well and leave it on the table. Leave it on the table for about an hour or two. Gradually it settles down and then on the top layer you will find organic matter. This is very, very important. I think you would have heard about the word mitti ke khushbo. Suna hai na? Mitti ke khushbo. Soil smell, soil fragrance. Is that really does the soil smell? Really? Mitti ke khushbo hai kya? Manwasna unda? No. It has no smell. You take the soil, dry it in the sun, and then smell, no smell. But when it rains, you get the smell. But water is odorless. So water has no smell, no fragrance. Soil has no fragrance, but there is mitigi pulvo. And that's because of soil organisms which live in the soil. So organic matter is very, very important. And for your information, my dear participants, our country, with our temperature, we need 2 to 4% or 5% of organic matter in our soils. Unfortunately, our national average is between 0.4 to 0.5%. I got to improve. Sir, I'm a common man. I'm a farmer. I have a farm. All my friends have a farm. How will I know that the farmer should know there is enough organic matter, enough organisms living in the soil? Well, when you walk on the soil and the cow drops the dung, just leave it for two, three days. If this dung becomes dry, we call it as varati or rupli. That means that the soil is devoid of moisture. The soil is devoid of soil organisms. But if this dung crumbles into small pieces, that means that it has moisture, it has organisms, and maybe it also has the leader, the earthworm. 
these two are very very important organisms earthworms as well as termites do the uh, do a wonderful job in recycling the organic matter these are organisms which work from beneath the soil and contribute to the greenery which you see on the top of the soil yes we don't like termites because they eat away our doors and windows but poor souls they also do a good job right this is what happens when there are soil organisms when the leaf litter falls down then they act on it they convert it into organic matter and they take it into the soil if you start looking at it a good farmer's field looks in this Romy way castings in a farmer's field you find them all over rich fertilizer indeed these are a very rich fertilizers which come and give nutrition or nutrients to the soil because one spoon of soil has several several billions of bacteria so if you start going into it that's the sentence which i had coined earthworm is the pulse of the soil healthier the pulse healthier the soil vermitech the term which i first used in 1992 vermus means earthworm tech means technology applying that these are our earthworms if you look into them please understand there are more than 3500 species of earthworms in the world india has more than 500 species we are, have a very rich biodiversity of earthworms but how can i remember the names not possible no you can't remember but we can always remember what work they do there are a group of worms which live on the top of the soil we call them as epi jake difficult absolutely not jake g e i c is derived from the word geo g e o geography geology earth earth epi means above so which live on the upper surface of the earth are epi jake and then there is a second group which lives inside the soil endo jake and there is a third group which goes in between up and down intermediates they are called as anesics anesic means intermediate sir but what is their role sir well fine young people who are listening to me when we go in a bus and uh, the bus stands uh, stop somewhere you know on the way for the sake of uh, uh, supposing you are traveling from bangalore to mysore it stops on the way for a small snacks we go inside and uh, the table is dirty and you sit over there first somebody comes and cleans the table and then you supposing you say that i need a dosa the waiter doesn't make the dosa he tells somebody else who is the chef who makes the dosa so three people involved one who cleans the table one who moves between the kitchen and you one who makes the dosa for you or the cook in the same way the endojeks are the waiters or the cleaners they keep cleaning the soil eating the soil the epijeks are the masters the chef who cook the food they take the litter they take the dung and they convert it into manure and it is the anesic worms which are very very important which keep moving up and down up and down up and down creating air in the soil and also taking nutrients to the roots of the plants okay now these are the regular indian earthworms normally we find but you must understand why sir are there so many earthworms well here is a beautiful earthworm called as octocetona serrata if you look at it carefully you can find that white spot which is calciferous glands now this earthworm lives in acid soil soil acidic kyun hota na jahan acidic soil hota hai like the red soil so when this earthworm eats that soil the calciferous glands they pour calcium carbonate they neutralize the soil and that comes out as a beautiful casting where the plants grow beautifully lovely you know these are called as ecotypes they grow in particular soils this is how an earthworm works now this earthworm is having its food the food enters the mouth and these white structures you find round structures they are the gizzard which crushes the food and the red ones are the hearts goes into the crop where the digestion is completed and enters the intestine every segment has nephridia nephridia are kidneys for the earthworms they pour nitrogen inside so carbon nitrogen combines and comes out as casting these are vermi castings these are the vermi castings okay this is the life cycle of an earthworm just understand it simple life cycle the cocoon gives from the cocoon comes a small worm the juvenile 
the juvenile becomes a non clitellate adult uski abhi mush nahi aayi ah young adult okay ah once the clitellum comes that means the worm is mature it mates and then produces a cocoon earthworms are hermaphrodites both male and female is present in every earthworm even then it requires a mate it requires a mate to partner itself they exchange their gametes this is how they exchange their gametes see here this is one earthworm its head the tail is on this end other earthworm's head the tail is on this end they exchange their gametes once their gametes are exchanged then the cocoons are produced i am not going to the details i tell you data when i meet you sometime in the brief time just understand that cocoons are produced and from this cocoon the young one comes out like this hi okay very good this is perionics excavatus indian earthworm it is found plenty in india from himalayas to kanyakumari lovely earthworm epigeic earthworm can be used for composting but many people use this earthworm this is icina fetida uh, you can call it as the uh, european worm or the red wriggler or whatever it is many people here this picture i took in china where my collaborators were working so this is icina fetida whereas in india another very important worm which is used for composting is utrilus eugeni this is called as the african night crawler african night crawler because it originated from there right fine making vermicomposting is very simple you have to initially decompose the material and then introduce the worms and keep a cow dung cake on the top cow dung cake hai na upli varti yeah if you keep it they start multiplying they start multiplying and then they start eating what what did you say ah uh, you said where can i get this earthworm cake where will i get the earthworm cake you won't believe amazon is selling it flipkart is selling it big basket is selling it yeah okay and this is vermi compost this is vermi compost sir i would like to make vermi compost in the field i have a lot of litter azim premji campus is a huge campus can i make use of it yes you can you can put sticks at the base and then take the organic matter put a 10 inch layer of organic matter better to shred it so that it enhances the process of digestion and then i must add micro what microorganisms very important easiest source you need not buy from anywhere easiest source i use is cow dung just take cow dung dilute in water sprinkle it and then you raise it as a heap simple heap and loosely cover it with the polythenes because you know like our weathers keep changing fluctuating now what happens inside the food gets cooked any organic biomass when it gets cooked no this heat generates inside and this heat can go to 55 to 65 degrees celsius very hot this is very very important for us why is it important because unwanted pests unwanted microbes undesirable seeds they all perish in this heat once this heat is over after about 15 days we just turn it over steam comes up and then after another a total 30 to 45 days the whole thing comes down it is ready now it's cooked now this material we cool it then we sieve it through a coarse sieve and then put it in a tank and then give the earthworms to feed on them the earthworms feed this material and then you pass them through a fine sieve and that is vermicompost an excellent fertilizer is that clear it has a large number of microorganisms all important necessary bacteria fungi actinomycetes algae lots of materials are present in them including trichoderma viridae lots of things but children be clear an earthworm is a segmented structure a nematode is not a segmented structure earthworm is annelida annelid means segments annulus nematode is roundworm so roundworm different from earthworm but be careful when you do vermiculture here is a, a planarian you would have seen them normally here it's very common in south india this feeds on earthworm so be careful 
at the same time whenever you do composting whatever compost you may do you may find this fellow coming in over there this fellow matures as a rhinoceros beetle rhinoceros beetle can attack coconut trees so you must be careful and if you happen to see such small maggots you must take it and feed it to the chicken okay you can do simple home composting very simple and uh, this is in my own house which i am doing composting where the worms multiply themselves if you can see this you know like how many worms are there yeah they keep producing a lot of compost for me all my kitchen waste gets recycled into compost sir i would like to do something at home but i would like to try in my school first or in my garden first very simple take a three feet diameter mark a circle don't take a scale roughly three feet okay and then one one and a half feet deep at the middle take that soil and put it around put little bit of cow dung sir cow dung is not available even i don't want to buy from online can i use something else khatta dahi sar curd very sar curd leave the curd not yogurt leave the curd which you prepare at home on the table for 2 3 days it will become yellow on the top it has a lot of uh, lactobacilli and uh, lots of other varieties of microorganisms just add on it decomposition starts then start putting a lot of organic waste from your kitchen this gets becoming compost after a few days on the inner side where you find the yellow air plant coriander palak and mint pudina and on the outer side where you find the green arrow have tomato okra that is lady's finger brinjal that is eggplant so on one side earthworms will come and prepare the compost over there and the other side you harvest the vegetables and eat them very simple things which you can do this is what we have been teaching to a lot of people here in tamil nadu through our things and those who want to do terrace garden please proceed if you have an old building within 3 ft from the last boundary wall you can have it and wherever you find beams you can have it 3 ft across sir even then my parents say that it is very old in that case you can make a cot like structure with either casuarina or bamboo and have them in bags very simple sir but i live in an apartment i don't have soil how much soil is required to grow plants well for growing pudina you require only 4 inches of soil and for growing methi you require a sweet box what we do now is we train children to grow methi in coconut shells ho jaye methi puri methi paratha methi chapati theek hai it's such a simple thing these are the burrows created by earthworms and here what happens we produce vermi wash vermi wash is a liquid fertilizer which uh, initially when i started this drum in 1992 it was uh, 200 rupees so people felt expensive so 50 rupees and then somebody said unable to then it was 10 rupees at that time so it is not the container the content is important and this is the content which comes from there where the earthworms act on the soil and through that the water slowly trickles down and that trickling water is collected in a bottle and that is vermi wash very simple mechanism very simple mechanism we have done a lot of experiments i am not talking just out of passion how what happens to the xylem vessels and how these are influencing the uh, mitotic rates inside the cells the cell division and what are the molecular structures of these compounds we have fascinating things which are present in these things and people say okay sir everything is fine but i don't have a green thumb if you have a thumb it is green is it clear start growing plants start having earthworms harvest is only the bonus so let us reworm the world because when it rains today water does not go to the subsurface when you have earthworms they make burrows and when it rains it goes to the subsurface it improves the whole ecosystem and that is our circulatory system of the soil which lots of schools here in tamil nadu have started working on and i wish that every school in the course of time will start developing such gardens encouraging children but if you have to do this work you must have patience because nowadays even if you walk quietly there is somebody to push you down yeah right so stay fast all the best good luck and that's in track thank you very much and all the best to you
Thank you so much, Professor Ismail. That was so fascinating, and it took me back again. Uh, and if uh, do you still have your demonstration uh, kind I of have it at areas? Home. I have it at home. You have it at I have home. It at home. So, and would you welcome us to come and take a look at it? Because Most welcome, very like nice. Seeing it, in yeah, uh, it's really really fascinating. Thank you for that quick uh, kind of overview on the role of worms. Um, as an ecologist myself, uh, one of the first questions I wanted to ask you because you uh, kind of showcased uh, the European worm and the African nightcrawler earthworms. Uh, but you also started your talk by talking about the native earthworms. So I wanted to know a little bit more from you, and I think our audience would also be very interested. Mm. Does introducing these non-native earthworms, is it a problem for the soil? Um, have you kind of also encountered uh, people asking you this uh, similar question and what does it mean for the native earthworms themselves because we know from other organisms that uh, you know introducing something from outside can mess up with local populations and therefore the food chain down the line i i fully endorse your view Vena. in fact okay. when uh, bangalore university is the bangalore agriculture university were the pioneers to introduce this uh, exotic earthworm especially utilized eugenie and uh, in one of the seminars in uh, IIT Bombay, we actually, you know, like uh, protested against the professor, I don't want to name them, mm -hmm. uh, that it is wrong to introduce uh, such exotic species. Incidentally, what happens is this exotic species eats very fast, grabs all the food and also reproduces very fast. In the bargain, if you have your local worms, uh, our endemic worms, and if you introduce these exotic worms, then the endemic mobs slowly fade away from them. So it is a negative impact. I fully endorse your view. Number two, in endemic worms, even if it is an epigeic earthworm, it slightly burrows into the soil and improves the soil structure. Exotic worms absolutely do not improve our soil structure. They just eat and excrete. So they are, they are not contributing to soil fertility. The, the, uh, what I meant by if you have a soil, if you really want to know whether your soil is healthy, you are supposed to be having your own local endemic ecotypes and varieties. These can be kept in containers to produce manure and can be considered as manure manufacturing factories. Okay, so if I understood you right, uh, and to summarize that, you say that uh, in order to uh, do things faster, you can put the exotic earthworms in a more contained space but you try your best to uh, develop your own native earthworms to do yes. the actual aeration yes. uh, through the thing. Okay, so that's- that's. I fully uh, agree to you. That's wonderful to know. And and so uh, ha this, has this been, uh, has this got traction from others? Uh, do you find that people are still using and introducing exotic earthworms? And if, you know, if, if as people who are listening to your talk, how do we put the word out there to people to, to, to actually uh, encourage more native earth uh, In fact, uh, many of the farmers whom I interact with, I request them to encourage local earthworms. Very simple mechanism. After a monsoon, start walking in the farm or the field. And naturally, wherever you have dumped some amount of organic manure or cow dung, or where people cook their food and use that uh, traditional silbatta and things like that, where the organic matter, or where they wash their plates, you will find that during after the monsoon, you will find small castings coming up. Yes. The, um, the some sort of a structures which are excreta yes. of the earthworms. Yes. If you happen to see them, then think that you are blessed. Just take make a slight depression in that area. Take half a kg of uh, cow dung and half a kg of jaggery. Mix both together, put it in that hole, put a jute bag, you know, like jute sack on the top, keep watering it for about uh, 20, 25 days. And then you remove, you will have a collection of native earthworms. Take them, use them. Super. That sounds so wonderful. Yeah. And uh, so, if I remember right, you also brought out a book on this exact process that you took us through. So while this recording is available, the book is also a really, really useful resource to have. You talk about things like this. I would encourage the audience to also quickly, uh, if, whenever you can, to type out earthworm castings to see how it looks. It's, they look like little, very cute uh, architectural kind of structures above the surface of the soil. 
so like Sultan sir said that, uh, you know, when you see it, it's great. It's, you have to welcome it. So on a lighter note, I wanted to ask you, um, in, in terms of what would you, what kind of an idiom would you use for an earthworm? So for example, we say busy as a bee, or we say uh, wise like an owl, or we say wily as a fox, or wild as a hawk, or mad as a hornet. Do you have any idiom that you would use or industrious like an ant? Wisdom as that of an earthworm. Okay, lovely. Okay. Because you don't hear <laughs> that very often and being such important fascinating creatures you know, yeah, I, I i before i answer some of the questions in fact i tell people that i have learned a lot from earthworms because when you show a strong uh, alcohol or a strong chemical or a strong light or a strong temperature if you take it close to the earthworm it moves away from it so it taught me if there is a problem anywhere you just slightly move away from it second is you <laughs> throw any rubbish on it it eats it and converts it into a value added product so if somebody is throwing rubbish on you, make use of it and build houses out of it. <laughs> it has taught me several things, actually. What a nice way to think of yeah, problems which are thrown at you. Because we really have nice. actually entered into a sort of a MOU. When uh, the earthworms okay. and I we oh. entered into a MOU. Yeah. Oh, I a see. Sort of okay. Okay. Of has, it been, has it been signed as well? Yeah, we have already signed the document. <laughs> it's a very, a very important document. That is, okay. as long as I am alive, I will go through them, and when I am gone, they will go through me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because I find it very unfortunate that we use the term "can of worms," no, for talking about negative yes. stuff. So I was maybe they were hoping... nematodes, not earthworms. Right. Okay. <laughs> we'll think of it that way. So you're not great friends with nematodes, is it? No, there are good nematodes as well as there are many parasitic nematodes. There is not a single earthworm which is parasitic. Okay. Uh, Sir, okay. Uh, one more. I I have a few questions. I'm going to continue to ask you, um, and then in, in about five minutes, we'll open up the audience questions. Um, if you look, at, you uh, you did say that there are three types of earthworms, right, or three groups of earthworms that kind of uh, occupy the different strata and the soil. Um, but um, are there certain types of soils that are more conducive for earthworms? We know that there are, there's black soil and then there is, you know, red, the more reddish soil that you find in Bangalore. Um, so are there, are there uh, you know, certain types of soils like loamy soils that are more conducive for earthworms? Or are earthworms really not as fussy and are found in every type of soil? Well, as you rightly pointed out, there are soils which the worms love, actually, like the loamy soil. The loamy soil is the best soil which they like, actually. And uh, they don't prefer highly clayey soil or sandy soils. They don't like it. In fact, you have to take soil in your palm, uh, slightly moisten it, take a small, uh, with your finger, take a small bead of it and keep making it into a wick. Keep making it into a wick, a thread, right? If the thread, you are unable to make the thread, it means that it is too sandy. Okay. You are able to make a thread and the thread goes on extending one and a half inches, two inches. It means it is very clay. You are able to make a thread, but the thread breaks after about half an inch or one inch. That means it is a loamy soil. So for a garden, as far as possible, preferably take a loamy soil. And earthworms love loamy soil. Okay. And this classification is not very strong classification. There are some groups of earthworms which trespass these zones. Some group of earthworms which can come from top to middle and keep moving. Some will be coming from bottom to top. But generally, we classify them into these three types. And I call it as a grand restaurant. <laughs> so, we a mad rush to concretize everything around us, whether it's in our private spaces or in our commons. Um, is it true that the surface earthworms, so the epigeic earthworms, um, are getting much more kind of, uh, you know, are they, are they being affected much more uh, compared to the earthworms below? And what does that mean for the soil ecology? Soil ecology, not only that, because, you know, like uh, as far as concretizing the floors and reducing the surface, uh, you reduce moisture harvest, you reduce water harvesting, mm -hmm. and thereby you also uh, lose earthworms because earthworms require soil. They are earth worms, so they require soil. And um, basically, I find that many people who love to construct a house, 
they offered them as a contract to some uh, architects and uh, construction companies. And usually what those people do is the rubble, they dump it in the open spaces and then they close it on top of the soil. So once you occupy the house, you feel it difficult to grow plants. So right from the beginning, when you're constructing a house, be very clear that you have water harvesting structures, you have enough soil space around you and start growing plants. Absolutely, when, when people, the more plants, and one more uh, very interesting uh, thing which I found is uh, the earthworms grow better and uh, microbes grow better, multiply better under certain litter, not under all litter. And that also I have found that most of the native trees, when the litter falls down and the mulching breaks down, and uh, we also, done, in fact, one of my students, uh, Dr. Geeta, she worked on that, where how the fractions in the leaf litter get transferred into the fractions of proteins due to electrophoretic patterns inside the earthworms during the growth stages. Can you break that down a little bit more for our audience, sir, if you don't mind? Yeah. Like, for example, when we take food, we, uh, people say that we are supposed to take uh, amino acids. And amino acids, there are two types, you know, like uh, uh, essential and non-essential. Essential are those which I'm supposed to consume from outside. Non-essential are prepared within the body. Similarly here, what happens is the, uh, the earthworms, when they eat their food, they take certain nutrients which get incorporated in their body. And these nutrients are available in endemic plant litter. So when they consume that food, they actually derive these uh, nutrients, which is very, very good over there. Thank you. So I, I have one last question before I open it out to the audience questions. Um, so, so far you've, you've told us what earthworms do for us, why they, you know, uh, how good they are for the soil and for the local ecosystem. Um, and in some sense, it's still very hu a very human centric view, right? It, we're, we're telling everybody that we need to do this for earthworms because they're good for us and good for our soil health because then we can grow crops and et cetera. But um, again, as an ecologist, as ecologists ourselves, what are the kind of relationships and associations that earthworms have with other organisms? Like, for me, it's always fascinating to understand, you know, do they have collaborations with other groups living in the soil with them? Do they fight? Do they have clubs? Do they have, uh, you know, do they have secret codes that they exchange with each other? Uh, those kind of things, it would be really nice. Uh, to know about that. Every, every organism, every organism has friends, foes, and uh, communication skills. Uh, <laughs> in fact, uh, they form a good community with millipedes, with uh, certain fungi, actinomycetes, and microorganisms. They do not like uh, centipedes. Centipedes eat away their uh, younger ones and their cocoons. Uh, they are usually attacked by rodents, by snakes, and birds. Birds are the worst enemies which keep looking for. And uh, I, they used to tell you, you know, like the early bird gets the worm. And I used to tell that the late worm would get caught. <laughs> That's how I would say the one who refuses to go into the burrow before sunrise. Yeah. But one interesting thing here I would like to tell that uh, when I was working with one of the projects with my student, uh, I, I, he later retired as a professor, Dr. Kalimur Rahman. Uh, we were working with some electrical stimulations and by chance, we happened to see bioluminescence in uh, uh, Lampito Morish, in the earthworm. Then we started working as to what should be the cause for this bioluminescence. And then we found that probably it is a sexual attraction where one comes out and signals to the other that, hi, I am here. So they produce a beautiful green light, uh, this particular species, on being tickled. So, you know, like they have various methods of communication and uh, they have photoreceptors, they have chemoreceptors. Uh, they are a wonderful set of organisms. Which uh, and in fact, Darwin's uh, quote was, uh, "Man is but a worm." Man is but a worm. In fact, Satchel, uh, Doctor Satchel, in his book uh, on ecology, earthworm ecology, had that as a cover page where he shows the different stages of earthworm growing into a human figure, and uh, uh, saying that because segmentation starts from anaida, and uh, earthworm is a classical example of metameric segmentation, which continues into the chordates, and we become human beings. Thank you, sir. So I'm going to read out a few uh, questions that uh, our audience has kind of uh, put in the chat box. Um, Prachi says, thank you for such an enriching session. Just a query. How do you differentiate between indigenous and exotic earthworms? 
Um, do you want to quickly take that, sir? And I'll also request Shashwat to put up uh, links to your other talks, to, to the books that you've written, uh, because I know that you have a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of material and information in, in, in those resources. Between indigenous earthworm and exotic earthworm, it's very difficult for a newcomer to know which is an endemic and which is an exotic. It's very difficult to tell them to differentiate. Usually, the exotics belong to the lumbricid family, whereas the endemics belong to the megascolicid group. And uh, it will be difficult for people to understand these scientific terms. But usually, megascolicids will have the clitellum closer to the anterior end. When you so take what the is earthworm, the clitellum? Can you the tell earthworm, us which yeah. yes. the earthworm normally when it matures, will have a ring-like structure which is very prominent and that is called as a clitellum. Okay. And in the case of our uh, megascolicid, that is Indian earthworms, local earthworms, this comes somewhere between segments 13 to 18. Okay. So very much and ahead. So you're, you're, sorry, you're counting it from the, from the top, right? From the, from from, the, from the mouth. From the mouth. From region, the mouth, from yes. the okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. And in the case of this western or lumbricid earthworms, it's slightly far behind. It's slightly behind. It's almost wow. about in the 20th segment, 23rd segment and so. So it is absolutely not possible for a lay person to immediately differentiate them. I can understand their curiosity for having asked this question. Prachi, thank you for asking this question. But, but the problem will be that uh, very difficult for you unless you bring a foreign earthworm and introduce. Now, what happens is normally when you go and buy this uh, dry cow dung and other things from some places where they are doing vermicomposting, even if you don't want, cocoons may come yeah. along with the dry cow dung and hatch in your place. And once they hatch, they multiply very fast. This you have to be careful. So, Dinesh asks, uh, in these times of chemical fertilizers, how do the earthworms survive? And have farmers adapted them in their farms for agriculture? How would the productivity be between uh, earthworm and its soil, et cetera? compared to, I think, uh, those which don't have. Mr. Dinesh, uh, it's a wonderful question. I do agree. We once upon a time had only organic agriculture, which was continued over here. By chance, we went into the green revolution. I do not want to go into the pros and cons of all these details in this short conversation. But very simple. You just take an earthworm, put it on your hand, take the salt which you eat, just the salt, table salt, and sprinkle it on the earthworm. It will wriggle and die. So you can understand that if you keep adding loads of fertilizers, nitrate is a salt of nitrogen, phosphate is a salt of phosphorus, and potash is a salt of potassium. So the more salt you add, the worms will start moving away from there, microbes will start moving away. You have a soil. The problem between these two components of chemical farming and non-chemical farming is, in chemical farming, you feed the plant, whereas in a non-chemical farming, you feed the soil and the kitchen in the soil prepares the food for the plant. So that's the reason why that plant becomes healthier because you are strengthening the plant, whereas here you are strengthening the yield. We have played this mischief for a long time that today our soils are deprived of nutrition content and the yield which comes from there, the grains which you harvest do not have sufficient quantity of nutrients in it. Instead of enriching the soil, that is, instead of protecting the mother, they have started fortifying the yield. Fortification is not an answer for our food. I hope I'm very clear here. I don't want to stray into that topic now. But if you keep fortifying food and keep adding iron, uh, iodine, everything to the food after harvest, it cannot replenish the real ingredients which come through food when the plant grows and yields by itself. Yeah. Well, I hope our policymakers are listening because <laughs> we know what's happening now as well. There was one question we missed before. Somebody had asked whether we need to dry cow dung or uh, fresh cow dung. Yes. Please use whatever you have. <laughs> um, yeah. Prakash um, Rajendra, use whatever you have. But for making some post, wet one works very well. If you have dry, just put it in the water, leave it for overnight. It becomes soft, then you can use it. No problem. A lot of it is just trial and error as well, right? What works yeah. for you in your space? So I think that that itself is a really nice learning uh, experience to go through. Uh, a more topical question, is there an impact of climate change on earthworms? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, sustainability, Zero wants to know. So. 
sustainability is zero, what are you zeroing in on? On sustainability <laughs> or sustainability at zero? <laughs> so, yeah. Just on the lighter side. Yes, climate change, many people feel that the sea levels will rise and all these things people will talk. But please be aware that climate change is going to have a great impact on rice, wheat and uh, uh, corn, the main food crops of the country, uh, of the world. Now, if these are getting affected, mind it, it's only minor millets which will be growing. And minor millets like ragi, bajra, jawar, these are the things which will survive. And I am confident, whether I am here or not, the future, India will be feeding the world. Most of Asia will be feeding the world. And for that, you require these things. Any climate change will definitely affect earthworms because the temperature of the soil increases. They migrate a lot. They will go to cooler places. If you and I can work together and have proper ecosystems wherever possible, we won't be losing our worms. So I'm going to shift to a slightly more positive question. Uh, mm. And this is from me again. Um, I would, uh, I, and our audience would love to know more about the module that you put together uh, for schools and for school teachers. Um, and uh, how did you, do you have any anecdotes from that? How did the teachers receive this? Um, how are the students using it in their own schools? Uh, and this is something, uh, this, is, this is part of the work that I do, I introduce uh, nature learning within school spaces. So no, I would be so very interested to know this. No, it yeah. so happened that. Uh... I was just working and uh, playing some games for and creating simple experiments for children, which also included something related to worms and uh, general science and biosciences. And the government of India got interest in the Department of Science and Technology. In fact, uh, Professor D.K. Pandey uh, from DST, he was very much particular that I should develop them more. And we formed a team and we developed 100 science experiments. We called it as simple tasks, great concepts. Uh, it has uh, had a very fascinating reception. In fact, the present government has taken a copy from me to say that, that they would like to convert it into regional language as well. And Portugal has already taken our copies and they are using it in their science teaching. These are all simple structures which teachers are very happy because, uh, to my knowledge, having working uh, working with uh, working with teachers over a period of time, it's, this is my 47th year of teaching. And uh, I find that there are many teachers who have an urge to do, but somehow the curriculum... <clears throat> And the so-called, uh, for which I never have cooperated, is that lesson plan. <clears throat> I, I, I don't understand the concept of the lesson plan so far. Lesson plan can ne never function inside the classroom. So uh, they, they try to put a limitation on the creativity pattern of a teacher. So there are many wonderful teachers now who are very creative. And this can be a source, a source of uh, facilitation for a teacher to take some hints from there and then modify themselves and create beautiful environment inside a classroom for the teachers. In fact, some of these uh, schools which have started gardening, I'm very happy about them. Most of them have uh, vermiculture also as part of their own thing. And I'm thankful that CBSC has introduced uh, organic farming and gardening as one of the subjects. My state government already has, Tamil Nadu state government syllabus already has their vocational stream on organic farming and all these components. So I'm sure that in future, children would have a, a exposure to these components. And if children are going to get exposed naturally, parents and teachers cannot be behind. And there's so much of learning we can do just by looking at the worms, asking questions. Um, unfortunately, and teacher, unfortunately, teacher is teaching flower and leaf on yes. a PowerPoint. Yes. <laughs> I don't understand the meaning. Yeah. Yeah. So like I said, I went to a traditional uh, you know, a school and college and the first time I experienced an experiential learning environment was when I came to your space. Um, and so it's, I really wish that we can do more of that in our educational spaces. Um, so uh, do you, I'm just looking at the other questions as well. Um, will earthworms survive in absolutely dry soil, say a garden that has been exposed to the summer sun without being watered for a stretch of time? Will you survive in a desert without a glass of water? Is my answer. <laughs> so I guess it's as simple as that. At least for us, it only yeah. quenches our thirst. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, like, in fact, no, no. In fact, because uh, uh, earthworms not only need water for drinking, but respiration is just like a fish. 
they have to take oxygen from the surrounding moisture. So if there's no moisture, there's no earth. There's no earth. And if you're traveling and if you have a garden, it is better that you create an environment where you have some sort of a filter that is a drip sort of an arrangement. Today, you have timer uh, switches that have come. You can have a drip machine attached to your motor, plug it in, and you set a timer. Every day, it switches on by around 6. It will switch off by 6.30, and your plants will be moist, your worms will be moist. Nothing to worry. Uh, Zen Rain Man wants to know, can earthworms drown if there is a flooded, if there are flooded fields like paddy? Whenever there is excess rain, you find a lot of earthworms coming on the top. In the same way. This is where traditional wisdom. Who asked that question? Uh, it was uh, somebody Zen who asked. Oh. Zen Zen hey, Zen Rain. Oh my God. Hey, 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 Vishwanath, 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 <laughs> Vishwanath, what happens is that's where the traditional farm systems come into my mind. You know, like uh, one uh, leader, I don't want to name them, uh, happened to visit the US and come back and uh, came back and told that there you have hundreds of acres of land and the tractor moves from one end to another end. Why do we have these small furrows in between? You know, like in, in Indian traditional agriculture, you will find there are ridges everywhere. We call them as cut uh, valor in between. Small, small fields with small ridges. This is why they were constructed. When the soil, when the soil is flooded with the help of uh, water, then these worms and microarthropods migrate into those things and stay over there. And once the water level goes down and some of the leaf decomposes enough organic matter, so they come back again and start working for the soil. That is the importance of traditional knowledge. And I'm glad that uh, Zen Rainman asked it and uh, because he works with a lot of water harvesting technologies. And uh, uh, my one day humble suggestion in an open field is what he does, earthworms also do in open areas. Yeah. Uh, Professor Asman, uh, Shushila wants to know, you said that we can grow methi and coriander in our homes. What else can we grow? And would we need to keep replacing these worms? What if they get into the food? What if they get into the food? How will they get into your food? They will never get into your food unless you take them and cook them. <laughs> In Philippines, you, they make earthworm patties. But also on the lighter side, they don't enter into our food at all. They don't enter. What you find as worms in fruits and vegetables are not earthworms. They are insects which leave their eggs and they hatch out as caterpillars. It is those worms, the maggots, which you find in the case of fruits. Earthworms don't enter. Don't enter at all. And uh, you can happily grow anything you want. Anything you want. You know, like, uh, yeah. well, one thing is, some of the plants which grow taller, all microgreens you can go, grow in small containers. If you want tomatoes, brinjal, you require a pot which is at least 12 inches high because it requires enough soil for the roots to grow in. So um, you, can, you, you please try whatever you want to. If it comes, fine. If it doesn't come, you learn a lesson out of it and you come to do something better. That's it. As simple as that. Uh, Vetriver wants to know, um, he also says thank you for the extremely valuable information. Could you kindly share what the difference is between compost created without earthworms and with them? Most of us do not use earthworms. So many in, in cities we use the composting bins, right? So Perfectly all right. Perfectly all right. Nothing to worry. <clears throat> compost is compost. Only thing is when you have earthworms, the advantage of having earthworms after the compost is produced and the com they multiply into it. If you are organically doing and if you are adding ordinary compost also, and if your soil is good enough, worms will automatically come if it is a grounded. If it is a terrace garden, then you may have to introduce the earthworms. Now, what happens is earthworm produces four substances. Please remember this. Every earthworm produces from its body its urine its feces. Third, its body produces a silomic fluid, which is very rich, which actually protects uh, the earthworm from being attacked by other organisms like microorganisms. Fourth, I think whenever you would have felt the worm, you find a sticky substance. It's mucus, which is highly mucilaginous, which has high protein in it. So all these four become culture media for microorganisms to multiply. It doesn't directly contribute to the soil. But this is the food for a large number of microorganisms. So microorganism community also grows with it. That's the one thing. Any compost you use, if you are doing it in the field, 
if it is a good compost, automatically worms will come if the soil is good and the, the worms are there. So don't worry whether you use earthworms or you don't use earthworms. Is that clear? Um, Vijata has an important, interesting question, an important one as well. Um, but why do we feel scared of these worms? Uh, and I can imagine many people feeling a bit creeped out when they see it or they feel it. Um, so she says, my granny used to put salt on them and then uh, when they would sneak into our homes during monsoon, uh, they used to die after much struggle and now I feel sad. And I'm wondering whether those uh, leeches also the same thing happens. And so can you take that question and can you also tell us if earthworms are related to leeches or not? Earthworms and leeches are cousins. Okay. The phylum Annelida, which has segments, is divided mm -hmm. into three groups. Polychaeta, Oligochaeta, and this uh, Hyrodinia. Uh, Polychaetes are those nereids and other things which are in the aquatic region, the sea water. You find worms which are used for fishing. And earthworms are the Oligochaetes. Oligo means few. Poly means many. Cetae is Cetae. So many Cetae in the body is Polychaetes. Limited Cetae per segment are the earthworms. Hyrodinia are the leeches, which are the ectoparasites. They are cousins, actually, but they are not related otherwise. Otherwise, well, all these organisms, they die when you sprinkle salt on them. I, I fully agree that uh, what uh, she had written, because uh, what happens is in those days, uh, people had used to confuse between the earthworm and Tiflops. Tiflops is a small snake. Uh, was, uh, and people used to say it as kankajur. That is, if uh, there are small babies at home, it may enter into the ear and go to the brain and eat the brain. And this and that stories used to be that. So they were so frightened, they would immediately put this so that they kill them. Second is, they feel that it is ugly, it is wriggly. Now, basically, some of the people now who know about earthworms, when they happen to see such worms coming into their homes, they collect them, put them in a pot and then leave it outside. So it all depends on your attitude. But her question, the last part of it is very beautiful. I feel sad now. That means she understood what are earthworms and probably it was not very clear. And if she's understood that, the, the answer is fully complete. What has happened in the past is past. Forget yes. it. Completely agree with you. Yeah. Um, Vijay, you have anything... Yes, yeah, somebody is asking about mimicry and earthworms. I want to do earthworms um, don't mimic anything. They don't mimic anybody. They just keep I, working on their own. But I think, I think she what she's wants to ask is, uh, have other things been inspired by the earthworms? So, for example, uh, the kind of architecture now in the cooling systems has been inspired by the termite mounds. So, uh, I think that was all, you know, the, the, the structure of the, air, of the craft uh, and the kingfisher. I think that's the biomimicry maybe from the earthworms what we could understand is their uh, stability is their structure their uh, annular structures not nothing more than that it has not influenced people nothing more than that in fact even though earthworms have been regarded respected over a period of time and uh, even at uh, my age when i was a kid i had read them as uh, farmers friends but it it remained only in the textbook it was only much later people understood the values of earthworms and honeybees. So, in fact, I have written a poem on earthworm and the honeybee. <laughs> what happens with each other? So, you know, like it's it's a it's a sort of an interaction, and uh, these organisms are very important, and they become a very essential part. The problem is for those who are attending us, there are two very important energy circuits. One is the grazing circuit, which happens on top of the soil, the animals eating fodder then all those things. The second important circuit is the detritus circuit, which happens inside the soil, where all the organic matter gets decomposed, gets converted. There are big factories, factories, which convert them into nutrients like nitrates, phosphates, potash, calcium, all these components are formed, which support the ecosystem for the plants to grow. So that circuit, the leader is the earth. So that's how they all work together as a team. He's a team member. Or should we say they are team members? No? They're yeah, they're all team members. Yeah, they're yeah. all team members. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so uh, is I, are you okay to stay on for another five minutes? Because we do yeah, yeah. have a few more questions, yeah. and I have a couple of questions I'd love to ask you. Shashwat, There's is that okay? Last question, I think after that, Prakash Rajendran has yes. asked. It. Can we use earthworm compost directly? And how do we know when the compost is ready? 
it's a simple way of asking a homemaker, how do you know that the rice has been cooked? <laughs> a compost, once you take it up, very simple mechanism is don't keep it very moist. Just keep the compost, ready-made compost in the hand, fold it very tight, open it. It should become a laddu. Use your finger and tap it. It should become a powder again. That is the best compost which you can produce. No smell and taste. Yes, yeah, smell. Smell, yeah. Eating your food book comes over there, yeah, automatically. <laughs> taste, I would say. I haven't tried. When I want, you can. <laughs> Since we're doing an experiential learning thing, we should use all our senses. But no, I always, when people ask me, does vermi wash uh, make everything grow? I said, I haven't tried it on my head. <laughs> okay. Uh, Nependra asks, what is the impacts of C to N ratio? Excellent, 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 excellent question for all those people who want to do composting. Thank you, Nependra. In fact, uh, C and ratio should be less than 30 if you really want Sir, to. Sir, can you explain to our audience what is the C and N ratio? I think that it is useful. for carbon. N is for nitrogen. Greener the leaf, more nitrogen. Drier the leaf, more carbon. If there is only carbon and no nitrogen, like for example, coconut uh, husk and other things, sawdust, these are all pure lignin. It's all 100% carbon. It will not get composted. It will rot. It will not compost unless you add nitrogen component into it. In the same way, if there's too much of nitrogen, like just fish waste, just chicken waste, and there is no carbon into it, it will start producing ammonia rather than compost. So you have to bring a balance between the two. Nature always produces things in balance. It's only for industrial composting, this will be very important. Otherwise, if you have a garden waste, it is already natural, it is already balanced. The ratio is usually less than 30 is to one, and you can happily do compost. So what are the impacts of, uh, you know, clearing the, you know, at least in Bangalore, there is, at least near my area, there are lots of these empty plots. And uh, people and the local governance bodies have this horrible habit of not only clearing it, but also collecting and now, you know, lots of leaf fall. Collecting lots of leaves and burning it all the time. Um, and I'm sure that's having an impact uh, on the top layer of our soil as well as to um, the earthworms. Um, can you give us uh, you know, a little bit more information about that? Because it, I think it will become useful when we have to communicate with, with our local governments, yeah, bodies. Basically, as you rightly said, they do it. But what I believe is uh, there is a wrong concept that all these things have to go to a compost yard for composting. Okay. All these things can be successful with decentralized composting procedures. What you require is just plastic cages, small cages, about uh, three feet high or four feet high, with four uh, uh, stands and a mesh around it. Keep putting the litter on it. Take a little bit of cow dung, dilute in water and keep sprinkling, keep it moist. Automatically, it will get composted and can be used for the same garden. You can do it in every garden, wherever there is a garden. But the urge to do it, there is no, there are, the, the, what happens is when the government, because now I'm the planning commission, I can understand these intricacies. Uh, we sanction funds for creating a park. We don't sanction funds for maintenance of a park. Yes. So, uh, and uh, there's no labor in, uh, available. Uh, there's been only one person who acts as a security. At the same time, he has to take care of this. Somebody may come and clean it up. So the gardener is the most sincere worker in every office. Every day morning, he cleans up the whole thing. And when he sees flowers come up, he's the happiest person. But the problem is one wind and all this litter blows up. The supervisor comes and shouts at the gardener. So the best way to escape is put it in a corner, light it up. The whole thing goes into an ash and he's happy. So we have to provide alternatives for them so that they can start working on it. And it can be done. And there's a lot of awareness now coming up in the minds of people. And people like you who are already working, Shaswat who is working, and all those people who are associated, and all these people who are attending are all people who want to do some mitigation in these things. Let me be very clear and want to tell you, Vena, and also to all my participants here, that we get carried away with this wrong concept of restoration. Restoration. You see, supposing a man is driving a two-wheeler, meets with an accident. Leg is amputated. If I can give back the original leg to him, 
then it is restoration. But I give only an wooden leg to him. The wooden leg or a Jaipur foot is not restoration. It is rehabilitation. So what you do to the soil? I hate people who take students and go for day cleaning and beach cleaning and all the stupid cleaning and not punish the fellows who have wrought, created a problem over there. And you know, like what happens is we can only rehabilitate. You cannot restore nature. Nature restores itself. And that can be possible by mitigation. And that is why we have all met here today as to how well we can mitigate with the help of natural resources and make it sustainable. Yeah, so let's hope that we all go back, dig some soil, find some earthworms, say hello to them, and just marvel at all the stuff that they're doing below our feet. And I remember what you told us a little earlier as well, a few days back when we met very briefly, that how there are so many bird watchers, but hardly any people uh, looking below the soil and uh, studying the organisms below the soil. Uh, and so we're hoping that more people will do this and we'll get much more information, research, and just fascinating stories about these organisms. And to just know them, not just because they're good for us, but because they're good for nature in general. Uh, yes. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Ismail. Thank you very uh, much. If there's any last words or any parting kind of thoughts that you'd like to share with us. Uh, my, only, my, only, my only request to people is, take care of the ecosystem, because uh, many people say that uh, we have to take care of the earth. We cannot take care of the earth. Earth takes care of us. So learn varied lessons. Be as far as possible what best we can. And uh, try to be eco-friendly as much as possible. I don't believe in people who say, stop plastic use. I tell them, judicious use of plastic. Because if I have to tell you, stop using plastic, I must first remove my frame because this is made of plastic. So judicious use of plastic. Do we require single-use plastic? Can there be alternatives? The one thing which I want younger people and belonging to the institutions like Shaswat from Azim Premji, Vena from Nature Conservancy, and all other friends who are attending is, try to first produce some alternative before you tell somebody not to use something. I would appreciate that we start putting our resources, our innovations, our ideas into components which can replace certain things and then educate people that let us have a very eco-friendly life. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much, Professor Ismail. We'd Thank love you. to know your next adventure because I know you're part of the planning uh, commission now. Um, we have already like... 2040 yes. as a target for organic agriculture for Tamil Nadu. Let us hope. And we hope other states follow the same. Now. Follow the same. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Shashwat, over to you.